In this chapter on airway and ventilation management, breathing, I'm going to start with a word on perfusion and go from there. If you recall in chapter one review, I said that your goal was to maintain adequate end organ perfusion. As you know, for a perfusion to be adequate, what needs to be circulating is well oxygenated blood. You can add avoiding hypoxemia and hypercarbia to your goal of maintaining adequate perfusion. Hypoxemia is the quickest cause of death for trauma patients. And for this reason, all trauma patients, even those that come in smiling and talking, get oxygen and pulse ox. When it comes to airway management, you, the staff, and the equipment must always be prepared to handle a difficult airway. Take a look at the airway decision scheme on page 38 for a general methodology to airway management. One of the major keys to airway management is the ability to recognize airway compromise early. From chapter one, remember the 10 second rapid assessment. Touch the patient, talk to the patient, and get a verbal response if possible. Here are a few things to think about when you evaluate the airway. Is the patient tachypnic, hoarse, agitated or anxious? Look, listen and feel with each area that you check. Are there abnormal sounds? Is the trachea midline? Touch it. Is there sub-Q air or a palpable fracture? Is ventilation adequate? Look, listen and feel. Evaluate chest rise, breath sounds, tachypnea, and oxygen saturation. And always be ready to suction and rotate the patient because vomiting can occur without warning. Don't forget C-spine precautions. And once again, make sure you say it on the practical. Airway management is not a one-man job. Your team must be present before the patient gets there. No yelling down the hall for help. And definitely, as you're preparing for the ATLS, remember lemon. Look for signs of a difficult intubation. Evaluate the 332 rule. Review the Malampati classifications for the hypopharynx. Obstruction of the airway means difficulty. And neck mobility is always compromised in a trauma patient because of C-spine precautions. Take a good look at page 36 for more on how to assess a potentially difficult airway. And you should have an airway protocol that you follow. Figure 2.3 on page 38 is a good example of one. A glide scope can be very helpful in these situations. However, not all hospitals have glide scopes available. So if you do have one available in your hospital, take some time and get familiar with it. Avoid nasal tubes when facial fractures are present. Yes, that includes NG tubes, nasopharyngeal airways, and nasotracheal intubation. If there's a black eye, nasal bleeding, or anything else that makes you raise an eyebrow, you need to stay out of the nose. When you consider intubation, table 2.1 on page 41 gives a good summary of the indications signaling when you need to intubate. Here are some key points on intubation that I think are going to be helpful for you to note. A Glasgow coma scale of eight typically means intubate. Pre-oxygenate with high flow O2 before and re-oxygenate with high flow O2 after each attempt. Hold your breath during each attempt, because when you need to breathe again, you know it's time to stop and oxygenate the patient. Rapid Sequence Intubation, or RSI. If you are comfortable with the drugs used during rapid sequence intubation, then fantastic. But if you're not, then by all means, call for some assistance. In addition to anesthesiology, in many hospitals, CRNAs or respiratory therapy will come to traumas and handle this part of treatment. So if you have one of these options, take it. Otherwise, awake intubation, though not fun, 
can be done when necessary. Remember, when you are using RSI, never paralyze a patient without adequate sedation. Let me just say a quick word about airway adjuncts. The gold standard for securing the airway is an endotracheal tube with an inflated balloon. Of course, the exception to the rule is applied to small children where uncuffed tubes are used. And even though the focus is on endotracheal tubes, you do need to be at least familiar with extraglottic devices. These are used more frequently in the pre-hospital setting when laryngoscopy has failed. And as you know, EMS is not typically going to have a glide scope to help with visualization. However, you can use extraglottic devices to salvage one of those can't intubate, can't oxygenate situations. This will buy you some time to oxygenate the patient until a definitive airway can be secured. Even if you don't expect to ever have to place one, you should review and get familiar with these devices. There's always that one in a million situation where you may have to replace one for a definitive airway. When it comes to being prepared for a trauma patient, you need to be able to do a surgical airway. In the ATLS course, you practice surgical airways along with other skills. But the two-day course is not designed to make you proficient in the skill. So if you're standing next to your level one trauma center's world-class ENT surgeon who is in the neck all day long, don't push him or her out of the way and say, I got this. But if in your critical access facility, you are it and the buck stops with you, then you might want to do some additional courses to get comfortable with these skills. Again, once you have established your airway, check it by listening to the lungs and stomach. Check O2 sat and end tidal CO2. Get a chest x-ray and if it's not too difficult, put a gastric tube down. 